Alhamdulillah, this is a poem that was written a thousand years ago by a scholar from Bust, Afghanistan, Abu Fath Al Busti. So he's attri he's at attributed to Bust, Afghanistan, which is southwest Afghanistan. He died in the year 401 after the Hijrah. So we're in the in the 1400s. So we're a thousand years later. And this uh, poem is a 60 some odd poem, 60 some odd line poem that's filled with wisdoms, Jazakallah Khair, and it is called Unwan al Hikam. It's called Unwan means uh, the guide. In Arabic, you call your, what do you call your Unwan? Your address, right? Because your address does what? It guides to your house. Without an address, how do I know how to get to your house? So the address guides to your house. So Unwan is the guide to wisdoms. And it's important for a person to study wisdoms. We're going to see here that in actuality, there have been lots of uh, poems written about wisdoms. There's been lots of, of uh, books written about wisdom. And wisdom is better than silver and gold. And how does a person gain wisdom? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُؤْتِي الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah says He gives wisdom to whoever He wishes. And whoever is given wisdom, فَقَدْ أُوتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا They've been given incredible goodness. So wisdom is incredible goodness, but the question then becomes, how do you gain wisdom? You guys tell me, y'all are wise. How do you gain wisdom? Yeah. Life experience. So experience is one of the best, greatest teachers. Yes, Najwa, what you got? Oh. Uh, still mercy. Okay, mercy. Okay, opens the brain, reading, right? Learning from the experience of other people. Yes? Being around people has wisdom. Being around people who have wisdom. Absolutely, right? So sitting in the company of the wise. If you sit with idiots, you're going to be foolish. If you sit with people who are wise, that wisdom is going to rub off on you. Yes? Go to an educational institution. Okay, go to an educational institution. And hopefully they will teach you wisdom. Absolutely, yes? Absolutely, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for wisdom. Always. One of the great, the greatest tool in trying to seek something is to ask it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? You're just combing your hair? <laughs> okay. Oh, you were reflecting. You know, reflecting is a way to get Oh, through reflection. Absolutely. <laughs> so reflection. Absolutely. Journaling. Sitting down with your thoughts. Um, reflection. Absolutely. You know, unfortunately, we live in a time when people try to mute out any moment in time where they could be introspective and reflective. So we walk around with our, hair, uh, our, our headphones all the time. Anytime we're not uh, engaged in something, we're, we're listening to something. You know, people, even when they enter into the shower, they're listening to whatever it is that they're listening to, right? Every moment is filled. So you never actually get the chance to sit with yourself. And uh, I once heard a person comment and say, how can you get people to like you when you don't even like sitting with yourself? You don't like yourself, right? So sitting with your, sitting with your own thoughts, sitting with, your, with yourself becomes a, an, a great opportunity for wisdom. Uh, and here we're going to be studying poetry that is filled with wisdom. And this, you know, brings me to um, right from the get-go. I think one of the things that we in the English language don't get to experience a lot is literature that teaches wisdom, specifically poetry. Books, there are a lot of books that teach wisdom, but poetry, do you guys have any poems that you, you read growing up that like spoke wisdom to you? Anything that comes to mind? <laughs> poetry for us, yes? Were you, were you going to say something? Poetry for us is, um, yes? Fire and ice? Okay, very good. Khalil Gibran? The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. Is that, that's a novel, isn't it? Is it a poem? It's a book of poem. Okay, very good. Khalil Gibran, did he write in English or Arabic? It's translated? I read the translation. Okay, very good. Um, anything else that comes to mind? So, amongst all of us, there's nothing, right? But that speaks to something. It speaks to the lack of, of experience that we've had with things that are beautiful, metered, rhythmic, that teach you wisdom. Unfortunately for us, we actually receive the opposite. We receive um, through mostly 
you know, poetry for us is consumed in the form of music, whether it's popular music or, or other forms. And a lot of times it's actually not wisdom. A lot of times it's ignorance. I read an article or I saw a statement re recently of someone who's considered to be one of the greatest hip hop artists of all time. He's in people's top 10 lists. And I was so disappointed in the article because he talked about why he doesn't rap anymore. And he said, the reason why I don't rap anymore is because hip hop is supposed to be for young people. He said, you have to be hip. And to be hip, you have to be young. And so I thought that was such a disappointing answer, irrespective of the position on music. My point is, is that as a genre, something that is such a major cultural influence in the United States never gets to benefit from the wisdom of those who have experience. So the guy who is rapping about foolishness in his 20s and talking about nonsense in his 20s, when he gets to his 30s and 40s and he realizes that now he actually, the things that he was rapping about in his 20s is nonsense. And now he has that audience that he's built and he can actually teach them that, you know what, what I taught you is not true. And there are things like family and there is things like building actual wealth and there are things like community. Now he's like, I don't have anything to talk about anymore. Right? And I found that to be just such a disappointing approach. But in any case, wisdom is better than, wis uh, wisdom is better than silver and gold. So we're going to begin with uh, Al-Busti. Yes, the poem. Just keep it away from me a little bit. Okay, right here. So very good. Jazakallah. We're going to do a lot of stop and go. Don't mean to mess up your flow, but... I, bars, right? That, that was just unex, unexpected. Unexpected. Alhamdulillah. No, but uh, it was a lot of fun. I started translating this yesterday. And so, uh, for me, poetry has to be translated into poetry. So it goes like this. It goes, a person increasing in the dunya is decrease, and any profit other than pure goodness is loss. And every existence that isn't permanent really means in reality that it isn't worth the cost. So, he speaks immediately about the issue of the dunya. We're going to see his introduction is going to be an introduction about the dunya. Even before he gets to his advice, he's telling you about the nature of the place that you're in. And so he says, Ziyadatul mar'i fi dunyahu nuqsan. That a person increasing in this dunya is loss. Now, is that absolute? That every time a person increases in the dunya, that you're losing? No, that's not absolute. But it is the case for a lot of people that the more invested they become in the dunya, the more they do it at the expense of their akhirah. And the person who is wise, the person who's intelligent, they know how to use the dunya as a stepping stone for the hereafter. They don't have to separate between the two. A lot of times people ask the question, how do I balance between my dunya and my akhirah? How do I balance between my dunya and my akhirah? The Sahaba didn't have to balance between the dunya and the akhirah. The Sahaba saw the dunya as their pathway to the akhirah. They weren't people who didn't have jobs. No, they worked. They weren't people who, who, who didn't tend to their families. No, they believed that that was one of the greatest means for them to seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being providers. But what they were able to do is number one, they didn't let the dunya distract them from their religious obligation. So they didn't let work distract them from the salah. They didn't let work distract them from the, the, the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obligated them on. But at the same time, they saw the dunya and they were able to manipulate their intentions to make the dunya that they experienced for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's a huge, huge chapter in the field of intentions. The, the wise are able to make their, their basic actions, their routine actions, they're able to turn them into rituals. So the Prophet ﷺ says, everything that you do is sadaqah, even the morsel that you place in the, in the mouth of your, of your wife. I mean, that is a very, very 
non-ritualistic gesture. It is a, it's a romantic gesture. It's a husband and their wife, a husband and his wife. But yet the Prophet ﷺ says, even that can be a charity if a person is simply cognizant of the fact that this is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's the reason why they do it. And so a person who is always thinking about pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their routine becomes ritual. Their routine becomes worship. Mu'adh ibn Jabir radiallahu anhu, he has an amazing statement. He says, إِنِّي He says, I expect reward for my sleep, like I expect reward for my, my qiyamul layl. Like when I go to sleep, I'm expecting to be rewarded for that sleep. Why is he expecting to be rewarded for that sleep? Because he doesn't just collapse on his bed at the end of a hard day's work. He is intentional about why he's sleeping. I am sleeping because I need to wake up tomorrow morning. He was a judge. I need to wake up and I need to be well rested to be able to judge between people fairly. And so that sleep becomes an act of worship, right? And so that intentionality with regards to your routine makes it ritual. And so a person can use the dunya to increase in the dunya. They can increase in the dunya and it can continue to benefit them in the hereafter. So the Shaykh's statement is not to be taken in absolute terms. <laughs> So he then says, وَرِبْحُهُ فِي غَيْرِ مَحْضِ الْخَيْرِ خُسْرَانُ He says, every prophet that is not in pure goodness is at a loss. And everything that is not permanent really is too expensive a cost. I.e. that you take the greatest pleasures in this life. Are they permanent? The greatest pleasures. Everything that we spend our lives chasing, one of the biggest problems that people have is that upon reaching their greatest goals in life, that that happiness is temporary. And now they have to go and find something else. And so he says, everything in this dunya is transient. Everything. And so if a person invests all of their eggs in this transient existence, then in reality, they're at a loss. Your life is so expensive. Your life was created to only purchase Jannah. That is the only exchange that is a fair exchange, that this life be used to an exchange for Jannah. So anything that a person uses their life for, for anything less than Jannah, becomes Khusran. It is a loss. so then he says, he says, Ya Amiran li kharabi dari mujtahidan, billahi hal li kharabi al khay al umri umranu. So he says, You who's trying to fix a home that is ruined, by Allah, is there anyone who'd like to fix a ruined life as well? If there was anything broken in our house, it's a fence that's broken, we got to fix it. If it's a door that's broken, we've got to fix it. We spend our days and nights building out these houses of ours. He says, what about fixing a broken life? Right? I don't have a, a fence that's broken, but I, I have a faith that's broken. Or I have a period of my life where I was broken. Shouldn't I work on fixing that? A man came to Al Hassan al-Basri. And Al Hassan al-Basri asked him and he said, how old are you? He said, I'm 60 years old. He said to him, you've been journeying to Allah for 60 years? You've been journeying to Allah for 60 years? You might meet him soon. And the man said, inna lillahi wa inna raji'un. To Allah we belong to him we return. And then he said to him, do you know what you're saying? Do you know what that means? He said, yes. It means that I'm the slave of Allah. I'm Allah's property and I'm going to return to him. So he said, so if you know that you're a slave, then know that you're going to be held accountable. And if you're going to be held accountable, know that you're going to be asked. 
And if you're going to be asked, then you better have an answer. Prepare a response. And the man said, so what should I do? Malhila, he says, what should I do? He said to him, be righteous, be good in what remains of your life. What has preceded will be forgiven as well as what remains. A person fixes their life by repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what they've done and being committed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your journey, whatever your journey remains of your life to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the scholars have said that whoever enters into uh, their 40s, they said, مَنْ بَلَغَ الْأَرْبَعِينَ فَقَدْ دَخَلَ أَسْوَاقَ الْآخِرَةِ Whoever enters into their 40s, they've entered into the marketplace of the hereafter. If you can imagine a person's life, because the Prophet ﷺ said that the lives of his ummah is between their 60s and 70s, okay? So 60s and 70s. So if a person, if you divide up your, a person's life, let's say 60 years old into three, the first marketplace is the marketplace of, of, of simply learning about this world. You spend the first 20 years of your life getting educated. And the next 20 years of your life you spend getting established, getting married, getting jobs, buying homes, whatever it is that a person does. And then the last 40 years, 20 years of that person's life, the scholars said, that person has entered into the marketplace of the hereafter. This is the time for a person now to... You guys are giving me morbid faces, but... You know, we all know that death isn't promised to anybody. We had Usher tell us about his cousin who passed away at 17 years old. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him and, and those who were swimming with him. We all were shaken by the news of Sheikh Abdullah Kamid, rahimahullah, passed away at the age of 39 years old last week. You know, worldwide renowned uh, reciter of the Quran passes away in his sleep in the middle of the day. So that's the idea, right? The more a person, we don't remember death so much as Muslims because of a sense of morbidity, but because it gives our life urgency. You realize you're grateful for every day that you have, and you realize that if you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if you're serious about your journey with Him, then the good news is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives what has proceeded and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives what remains. <laughs> أنسيت أن صمور المال أحزان زعيف آدعني الدنيا وزينتها فصفوها كدم والوصل هجران So he basically continues saying O oh, you who's covetous in trying to continue to gain wealth haven't you realized that seeking wealth brings sorrow and dread? Seeking wealth uh, brings sorrow and dread. So the Prophet ﷺ, he gives this incredible uh, example of people who are always seeking wealth and seeking status. And he says that there is no... If, if you starve two wolves and you unleash them into a, 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 a group of sheep, those wolves would not do more damage than a person's desire for money and status does for their deed. I want you to imagine ravenous wolves unleashed on a flock of sheep, what they would do. And the Prophet ﷺ gives this example for the person who's always seeking fame and fortune, these two things. Because if a person does not fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regards to this, and if a person doesn't feel any sort of contentment, then that person will do incredible things for the purpose of these two items. And that's why the Umar ibn Khattab, when he was asked about a man, do you know this person? And the man said, yes, I know him. He comes to the masjid all the time, blah, blah, blah. And then he said to him, okay, hold on a second. Have you traveled with him? The man said, no. He said, have you done business with him? He said, no. He said, have you lived with him? He said, no. He said, then you don't know him. Why does he say do business with him? Because business and the desire for money makes people who are quote unquote religious turns them into wolves. You can have that brother, he comes to salah all the time, no problem. Comes to the masjid all the time, first row, all the time. Sister is very righteous. But when you start dealing with them with money, money is a completely different level. It is a game changer. And so, when a person, for the love of money, sacrifices their deed, there are few things that are more disastrous.
كيف؟ لعبوا فؤاد عليه الدنيا وزينتها فصفوها كدر والوصل هجران وأرعي سمعك أمثالا أفصلها كما يفصل ياقوت والمرجان ومرجان yes so he says empty the heart of the dunya and its adornments its purity is contaminated and what it connects it disjoints and listen attentively to examples that I have filtered like rubies and pearls by the one who filters, selects and appoints. He says, empty your heart from the dunya. That's it. That a person empty their heart from the dunya. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, what is something I can do that will make people love me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love me? He said, ishad fi dunya yuhibbukullah. He said, have zuhd in the dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you. And zuhd is one of those really difficult to translate words. Zuhd, Z-U-H-D, is a word that we're just going to have to bully into the English language because asceticism isn't going to cut it. You've never used asceticism in a sentence except when you're translating Zuhd. So Zuhd is when a person is not attached to the dunya. Zuhd is a person whose heart is empty of the dunya. It does not mean that a person does not have money in their hand but it means that money is in their hand and it's not in their heart. The Prophet ﷺ was a, the greatest Zahid, but he had money in his hand. Uthman ibn Affan was a great Zahid, but he had money in his hand. Eight, six of the 10 who were promised paradise had money. We don't have a problem with money. Money is a magnifier of what is in a person's heart. So if a person's heart is filled with love of the dunya, then money is just going to magnify it. And if a person's heart is detached from the dunya, then the Prophet Sallallahu says, how excellent is wealth in the hands of a righteous man. How excellent is wealth in the hands of a righteous man. It just magnifies the goodness that that person's heart wants to do. So he says, be careful of the dunya. فَصَفُّهَا كَدَرٌ Because what is safi of the dunya, what is pure of the dunya, is kadar. It's murky. It's cloudy. The best experiences in the dunya, they are contaminated, they're corrupted, you're never completely happy. People in their most happiest of moments, they're worried about hasad, don't take a picture of me in this moment right now, right? We, we are always worried about something, there's always something there to impinge on the purity of our happiness and the purity of that moment. And so he says, the dunya, I mean that's the akhirah, that's jannah. وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِلْ إِخْوَانًا عَلَى سُرُورٍ مُتَقَابِلِينَ Allah says, we removed all negative energy from their hearts. They are brothers on cushions facing each other. The Akhirah, the Jannah is where all of that perfection comes to exist. Yes. And then he says, now, he's, he says, I'm going to begin giving you some, uh, some wisdoms. This was all his introduction. He's like, now I'm going to give you some wisdoms that I filtered for you like Pearls are filtered, like ornaments are filtered. Yes. Very good. So, his first advice, which we could spend the rest of the night on, but inshallah we won't. Ahsin ilan nas. Have ihsan to people. Tasta'bid you will make abd, you will enslave قلوبهم, their hearts. How long has ihsan, excellence, enraptured people's hearts and enslaved people's hearts? Like it has been, it's been happening for forever. That ihsan has been, now he says, ahsin ila nas. He says, have ihsan. Well, first of all, what is ihsan? The Prophet ﷺ defined Ihsan in the Hadith of Jibreel. He says that you worship Allah as if you see Him, and if you don't see Him, that you know that He sees you. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us, in the Hadith that's reported by Muslim, He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed Ihsan upon everything. Everything. Ihsan, this level of excellence, is required in everything that we do. And when you show ihsan to people, they can't help but love you. They can't help but love you. 
If you show good to people all the time, even if they don't like you, you end up winning them over. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةَ اِتْفَعْ بِالَّتِ هِيَ أَحْسَنَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, the good and the evil are not the same. Repel with what is greater. What happens when you show goodness with ahsan? You always show people that which is better, ihsan. They insult you and you smile. They insult you and, 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 and they wrong you and you do right by them. You do better by them. فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَ Allah says, كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ The one who between you and them is enmity, the one who hates you, they will turn into a wali, an active protector. Allah says. But the only people who get to experience that transformation of people is الَّذِينَ صَبَرُ You have to endure. There has to be patience there. On day one, they might not like you. On day two, they may not like you. On day ten, they may not like you. On day hundred, they may not like you. But you continue to show goodness. Eventually, inshallah ta'ala, they will turn around. وَمَا يُلَقَّهَا إِلَّا ذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ Allah says. And the only get, ones who get to experience that transformation are those who... And you know, th this verse, I've told you guys, I'm sure this before, but this verse, it always reminds me of one particular person. Who is that person? Okay, nobody knows good. I didn't tell you this before then. Muhammad Ali, rahimahullah, the champ. This verse always reminds me of him because he was hated. At one point in time, he was the most hated person in America. They stripped him of his championship. They, you know, he was a black Muslim at a time when black Muslims were hated and vilified and scared. Uh, people were scared of. And he was very braggadocious and he was proud. My name, not yours. My color, not yours. My religion, not yours. But guess what? He continued to show incredible charisma, kindness, generosity. Like he didn't turn into this person who met fire with fire. But he continued to show the beauty of his own character. And so, you know, even white, he would go on white talk shows and he would talk to them. And he would be as endearing and as charismatic and as genuine as we all know him to be. And so eventually over time, what ends up happening? When finally the rumble in the jungle, the jungle happens in Zaire. And he, you know, defeats George Foreman and he knocks George Foreman down. Howard Cosell, the announcer, he says something that I've never heard said about any boxer ever. You can watch the, you can watch it yourself. He goes, the, he's done it. The great man has done it. He says, the great man has done it. Not the boxers that are, not the, the greatest fighter of all time. He says, the great man has done it. Ihsan. Right? قلوبهم. Now here's an important point. The Shaykh here is saying, if you show Ihsan to people, you will enslave your hearts. Now, we don't show Ihsan to people to enslave people's hearts. A person says, okay, this is the formula for people to like me. So, right, because these are intentions. And intentions have to be done for the sake of Allah. So, I show Ihsan to people because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves Ihsan. Whether it enraptures their heart or it doesn't. Because guess what? There are going to be some people who you show Ihsan to, and it doesn't capture their heart. Ihsan captures the heart of a person who is noble, a person who is good, a person who has good qualities. But they say, Al Ihsan is ta'bid al Karim. It, it enraptures the heart of the Karim, the person who is noble. But a person who is a, a jerk, a loser, a person who has a bad character, that person, you show them all of the Ihsan in the world. And it only increases them in distance. They don't appreciate goodness when they experience it. And I think we've all experienced people who are like that. You show them goodness, they don't say thank you. You show them goodness, they don't appreciate it. It only makes them more entitled. It only makes them more uh, aggressive. It only makes them more rude. So this is also not absolute. But again, it is something that we seek because ihsan is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. What are three spheres of ihsan? that the Muslim community in Houston should work on perfecting. Three spheres of Ihsan. Now, I want you to pay attention to this, and maybe we'll do it after Maghrib, because I, it's going to be a, a, an intense discussion. But, he says, Ahsin ila nas. He says, have Ihsan to who? The people. Not the young and not the old. 
not the Muslim and the non-Muslim. He says to everybody, not the rich and not the poor. He says, Ahsin ilan nas. Be good to all people. Show ihsan to all people. And in doing that, you will enrapture their hearts. Okay, so I want to just end with, I mean, again, this ihsan thing can be a very long discussion. But I just want to mention a few points on ihsan, this idea of excellence. Number one is that ihsan is independent of a person's economic status. We see Yusuf alayhi salam's story in Surah Yusuf. He's approached by prisoners in jail and they say, can you please interpret this dream for us? Inna naraka. We see you to be of al-muhsineen. We see you to be of the people of ihsan. And he's a prisoner like them. But they're like, you seem like a person of ihsan. Why? Because of the excellence that Yusuf manifested and showed even in imprisonment. And then we fast forward, Yusuf is you know, in charge of the agriculture of Egypt. And his brothers show up and they say, can you please help us? Inna naraka, we see you to be of the muhsineen. Same words are used. So Yusuf alayhi salam's ihsan is independent of his circumstances. His external circumstances do not affect his character, his integrity, his excellence, his ihsan. You should be of the muhsineen, whether you're a student, whether you're a staff member, whether you're the manager, whether you're the CEO, whether you're the parent, whether you're the child, whether you're the sibling. No matter what, that ihsan should be a constant aspect of your character. And then another manifestation of ihsan is to do your work well. To do your work well. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi says, Inna Allah yuhibbu idha amada ahadukum amalan an yutqina. Reported by Al-Bayhaqi. He says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that if one of you does something, that they do it well. And it has nothing to do with the one who's receiving it. You're doing it because of who you are, not because of who they are. And Al-Manawi, he mentions a story. He says that there was a, a Muslim, he was a craftsman. And someone had asked him to make something. And so he made it. But he cut corners. Maybe the guy wasn't paying him that much. And so he cut corners and he just kind of hurried up and he did it. And then he gave it to him. And the man was happy with it. But this guy who made it, he couldn't sleep. And so finally he remade it. And then he went to the guy, found him, and he said, I've made you another one. Give me back the one that I made for you. He's like, why? It's perfect. It's fine. He's like, no, it's not. And then he said, anyone who does not perfect their work has not shown gratitude to what Allah has taught them. Anyone who doesn't perfect their work has not shown gratitude to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught them. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me the talent, the skill, the ability, the, the, um, the knowledge to be able to do something with ihsan, and then I don't do it, then I haven't shown gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is incredibly ugly when a person who has potential and ability falls short. وَمَا رَأَيْتُ فِي النَّاسِ عَيْبًا كَنَقْصِ الْقَادِرِينَ عَلَى الْكَمَالِ I have not seen in people a deficiency like the deficiency of the one who's able to be perfect. It's ugly. When you have a person whose potential is an A, a student and they're getting C's, you're not going to talk to them like the person who's getting C's and you can tell C's is the best they're going to do. Right? Like that's like amazing for them. Right? They're overachieving. The person who's underachieving at C's is not like the person who's overachieving at C's. Okay? Anyway, so these are some manifestations of ihsan. What's our uh, okay, so then the question becomes, uh, what's the difference between ihsan and taqwa? Taqwa is that a person shields themselves from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ihsan is that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see him. Taqwa is an act when it comes to staying away from the prohibition, prohib uh, prohibitions, whereas ihsan has nothing to do with prohibitions. Ihsan has to do with the quality of the acts of worship that you do that you're always increasing it because you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. Yeah, so Ihsan, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, it's that you worship Allah as if you see him and if you don't see him, then you know that he sees you. So that's gonna increase the quality of everything that you do. And so she gave the example of Aisha radiallahu anha, she's giving sadaqah and Aisha used to perfume her sadaqah. They're gold coins, she would perfume them and she would say it's, it's, it's falling in the hands of Allah before it falls in the hands of the person. So she's interacting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Abu Huraira عنه, he used to make wudu, and we don't copy Abu Huraira in this, but he used to extend his wudu up until his, the middle of his biceps. 
and he used to extend his wudu up until the middle of his shin. And the reason why he did that is because he said the Prophet ﷺ said that these parts of your body are going to be illuminated on the Day of Judgment. So Abu Huraira said, whoever of you has the ability to extend his illumination, then let him do so. So the point here is that Abu Huraira, while he's making wudu, is not just making wudu like many of us make wudu most of the time, which is just you know kind of getting through it. But he's connecting this act of wudu to the light that I'm going to have on the Day of Judgment. He's mindful of that, and so he's actually interacting with his wudu according to what he's expecting to experience on the Day of Judgment. It's a much higher level, it's a much higher quality of worship. And so the more a person is able to be mindful of who you're interacting with, who you're worshiping, absolutely it increases your ihsan. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, and the reason why is because those two verses, Ya Khadim al Jism, the O you who's serving his, uh, his body, it's, it's almost like uh, it's two verses that other versions do not have, and it doesn't really fit the context of what is being spoken about. He just spoke about this idea of Ihsan. And he's talking about your soul. And so him to just all of a sudden be talking about your body doesn't really fit. The next line is better. And this is what um, uh, Sheikh uh, Saeed al kamiri mentions in his sharh of this. So the point here is the next one is he says, in asa'a, If someone wrongs you, you're showing all of the ihsan in the world. You're showing all of the ihsan in the world to people. And then what happens if someone wrongs you it's okay. He says, فَلْيَكُنْ لَكَ فِي عُرُودِ زِلَّتِهِ صَفْحٌ وَغُفْرَانٌ Which lines did you skip? No, no, don't worry. Those are, those are the lines that I was saying, yeah. So he says, and if someone wrongs you, then let yourself be in the scope of their mistake, overlooking and forgiving. I'm showing all of this ihsan to people and someone still wrongs me. He says, when people wrong you, you know what you should do? Make an example of them. Cut off your relationship with them. Cancel them. No, he says forgive them. He says forgive them. <laughs> Overlook their faults. I had a friend for 15 years and then they wronged me. So I'm never going to talk to them again. Khalas, you're dead to me. Okay, so now you make a new friend. That new friend that you make, that you replace this friend with. Are they never going to wrong you? They're going to wrong you. So then what are you going to do with that friend? Cancel them too. And then what are you going to end up with? No friends. Eventually you're going to end up with no friends. So he says, when someone wrongs you, because that's the nature of human beings, overlook their faults. The Prophet wasallam he says in a hadith, he says that the believer, الَّذِي يُخَالِطُ النَّاسِ وَيَصْبِرُ عَلَىٰ أَذَاهُمْ The believer who mixes with people, and endures their harm. Yasbir ala adahum. Endures their harm. Is better than the believer who doesn't mix with people and doesn't endure their harm. And I'm amazed that the Prophet ﷺ paired these two things together. Mixes with people and endures their harm. As if to say, for you to mix with people, necessary consequence. Necessary consequence is that you're going to endure harm. You are going to incur harm. Whether you endure it or not is up to you. But he says that the believer who mixes with people and endures their harm is better than the believer who's like, I'm done with people. I, uh, I want my peace of mind. I don't want to interact. With, I'm, I'm, I'm not coming to the masjid anymore. I'm not dealing with this community anymore. Endure people's harm. Human beings are imperfect, which means that some of that imperfection is going to be experienced by you. It's going to manifest in a slight, it's going to manifest in an insult, it's going to manifest in a fight, it's going to manifest in a lot of different things. Being wronged financially, being wronged in your honor, being wronged in all of that, that's going to come from people. And you are to forgive and have resilience. Have a little bit of a thick skin. We have to have it with each other. We have to be able to overlook each other's faults. We have to be able to forgive and move on. Otherwise, you're not going to have anybody around you. And in reality, you know, 
I remember Sheikh Saeed al Kamri one time when he was here in Houston, he came. And someone asked him a question. It was at Dawa Center. And he asked him and said, I'm done with the Muslim community. Because, and I don't even want to be Muslim anymore. Because I have only experienced harm from the Muslim community. So he said to him, if you leave the Muslim community and you go hang around in the non-Muslim community, you're not going to experience harm? Or is that just part and parcel of dealing with human beings? If you find some aliens, maybe they won't harm you. But anything else, or anyone else, you're going to experience harm from them. And so when you experience harm from them, what should you do? You should overlook and forgive. People always ask the question then and they say, okay, do I forgive? Does that mean that you forget? No, it doesn't mean that you forget. It doesn't mean that you forget. It doesn't mean that you get taken advantage of again and again and again. But it means that I've, I, 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 it depends on what the mistake is. Right? And everything is to be dealt with accordingly. If someone has wronged me financially and someone's stolen from me, I'm not going to give them money again. But if it's something where a person is repentant and it's something where I am in control, then absolutely. And one of the greatest examples of both forgiveness and ihsan in the seer of the Prophet وسلم, is Mistah and Abu Bakr. Mistah is the cousin of Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr is spending money on Mistah. He's supporting him financially. And when the slander happens against Aisha, and people are speaking about what they have no knowledge of, Mistah is one of the people spreading that rumor. Literally biting the hand that feeds you. And he's your family member. Like Mistah is the person who should be, out of everybody, going to war on behalf of Abu Bakr and his family. He's literally spending money on you. And Mistah instead is, is spreading rumors about Aisha, literally the, the, the honor and dignity of Abu Bakr, his daughter. And so when finally the verses of Surah An-Nur were revealed, declaring Aisha's innocence, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says, I'm never going to help Mistah again. You could imagine the disappointment, the hurt, the betrayal, the anger of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and let not those who are given uh, sa'a, comfort, wealth, let them not avoid spending on their relatives. And let them overlook and let them forgive. Do you not wish for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you? And so Abu Bakr immediately, when it's phrased like that, he's like, of course I would love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me. And so one equation that a person can always, or one exercise a person can always practice when it comes to this issue of forgiveness, is that you ask yourself and say, if by forgiving this person, Allah would forgive me, would I forgive them? And if the answer is yes, then forgive them. So he says, and always be assistant, always be a tool of assistance for those who have hope. In your assistance for the noble are quick to assist. For the noble are quick to assist. But let's keep going. He says, وَكُنْ عَلَى الدَّهْرِ مِعْوَانًا لِذِي أَمَلٍ He says, uh, he says uh, and be a mi'wan. Mi'wan in Arabic is كثير uh, العون. It's someone who is incredibly helpful. This form, this grammatical form is called mif'al. And mif'al is isim ala. It is a, a word that is used for a tool. And so this form mif'al, for example, the tool that is used to open things is called miftah. The tool that is used to, for siwak is called miswak. The tool that is used for uh, weighing yourself or weighing something is called mizan. Okay, so that, that grammatical form. So he says, he says, be someone who is a tool of assistance. For those who have hope in your assistance, for al-hurru, al-hurru mi'wanu. A person who is noble, hur, in Arabic means what? 
It means free, but it also means noble, kareem. Okay, so you say fulan hur. It means like that person is, is generous, this person is noble, this person is good. So he says, for the noble are helpful. I.e., be as helpful as you can to people. That's what he's telling us to be. Be as helpful as you can. Any help that you can provide people, be that person. Ibn Abbas عنه, has a beautiful statement. An amazing statement. He says, there are four people that I'm not able to repay. The cousin of the Prophet He says, there are four people who I'm never going to be able to repay. Number one, a person who precedes me in salam. A person who says salam alaikum to me before I said salam alaikum to them. That's number one. Number two, a person who made space for me in a gathering. We really belittle that. Until you go and you sit in a circle where nobody makes space for you. And then you get the value of a person just shifting a little bit to the side. I think that happened to me yesterday or the day before. Or the day before that, I don't remember. But it was like, it was like, like just nobody made room. So that, just that gentle gesture of, you know what, we're in a circle, there's somebody sitting outside the circle, let's make space for that person. Okay? And then he said, number three, a person whose feet got dusty walking around to do something for me. Somebody who went and did something for me. He's like, I'll never be able to repay this person. And then he said, number four, he said, this person, can, th this fourth one, can only be thanked by Allah. I have, no, I, I have no ability to repay this person. They said, who is this fourth person? He said, someone who had an issue that kept them up all night. Something that they were worried about, a problem. And then the next day, they came to me with it. They thought me worthy of their problem. That perspective of the person who comes to you, seeking your assistance, it is a great testimony on their behalf of what they think of you, that they came to you with their problem. Because people don't come normally, people don't come to people who don't, they don't think they can solve their problems. Normally they go to people who they think are qualified, able, competent, skillful, whatever it is. Right? And so it's actually a praise. It is a testimony to you when a person comes asking you for assistance. And so he says that person will never be able, I can't thank him, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can thank that person. And so always trying as best as you can to be helpful and assist other people. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. He says, afdal? What action is best? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, belief in Allah and jihad in his path. And then he says, and what, what, uh, what slave is best to be freed? When you're emancipating people, who's the best to emancipate? He said, the one who is the most expensive and most beloved to his master. The one that's going to cost you the most. And then he says, what if I can't do that? What if I can't free anybody? What if I can't do any of these actions? So he says, تُعِينُ صَانِعًا He says that you help somebody who is an artistman. You help somebody uh, create something. And then he said, and what if I can't do that? He said, تَكُفْ شَرَّكَ عَنِ النَّاسِ he says, if you can't help people in any good, you can't free slaves, you can't assist in, in anything, you, you, you have nothing positive to contribute. There's still something that you can contribute to people. You can still be helpful in some way. Do you know that way to be helpful? Oh, and this is one that's so important. It's really one that we should all jot down because you are going to come across somebody very soon who you're going to need to share this with. The Prophet Sallallahu when Abu Dhar asked him, what if I can't do this, what if I can't do this, what if I can't do this? He said, keep your evil to yourself. That will be a sadaqah that you give on yourself. It is a sadaqah that you spend on yourself. Keep your negativity to yourself. Keep your lack of belief to yourself. Keep your criticism to yourself. Keep all of that to yourself. If you can't be somebody who is helping people do things, then at least don't be somebody who's stopping people from doing things. If you can't assist, then at the very least do not harm. And if you intentionally not harm people, keep silent, 
not criticize, all of that type of stuff, it becomes a sadaqah that you give. It becomes a sadaqah that you give. So let me keep going here then. He says, and uh Judaika bi Abdullahi Mu'tasima and hold fast to the rope of Allah, Mu'tasima, holding fast to it. He says, because it is the needs of support when all means of support fail to exist. Hold fast to the rope of Allah. What's the rope of Allah? The rope of Allah is the Quran. The rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the sunnah of the Prophet. The rope of Allah is the, the messenger himself holding fast to the rope of Allah because that is what stays fast when every other means of support disappears. Everything else lets you down, but the Quran doesn't. The Sunnah of the Prophet doesn't. But not only that, it's going to continue and it's going to come back. And then he says, and have taqwa of Allah. Because taqwa, the consequences of taqwa are praiseworthy. The consequences of taqwa are good. You know, taqwa is the Prophet was asked, what is the action that brings people most to paradise? And he said, taqwa and good character. And what's beautiful about Islam is that the message of Islam is so consistent. The Prophet in one verse or in one hadith, he's asked, what is the thing that brings the most people to paradise? And he says, taqwa and good character. Where does the Quran command taqwa? Everywhere. Everywhere. You hear it in, you hear it in the, uh, sorry, don't worry about it. You hear it in the, in the uh, khutbah every week, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yeah, or you hear it, Ya you had nasu taqur rabbakum, ya you ladhina wa taqur Allah, ya you had nasu, ya you ladhina wa taqur Allah haqqa tuqatim. Again and again and again, the command for taqwa. What is the consequence of taqwa? Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you in the dunya, always making for you a way out. Allah says, wa may yattaqi Allah yaj'allahu ma'arja, wa yarzukuhu min haythu la yattasim. Whoever has stuff of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide from them a way out. And he will, he will give them from where they didn't expect. Taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be with you in the grave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be with you on the day of judgment. Until finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you in Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the end of Surah Al-Qamar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the people of Taqwa will be in gardens and rivers in the company of a glorious king, Malikin Muqtadil, full of ability. So the people of Taqwa are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the dunya, and the people of Taqwa are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the akhirah. And he says, Taqwa, its consequences are always good. The Prophet sallallahu would give the advice of Taqwa to Mu'ad ibn Jabal when he asked him, and he said, have Taqwa of Allah wherever you are. That's Taqwa. And Ramadan, we just came out of the great school of Taqwa. And so he says, uh, it will protect you. It will protect you from the harm of everybody. And then let's do our last line now. He says, <laughs> He says, whoever seeks help in other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that their nasir, their supporter, is simple humiliation and loss. The Prophet Sallallahu he saw a man once with a talisman. Talisman. He had a, a ta'weez. Okay? And the Prophet Sallallahu he says, Man allaqa shay'an wukila ilayh. Whoever hangs something, they will be left to that thing. A person who has something thinking that this will benefit them or harm them, he says, whoever hangs something, it will be, you'll be left for that thing to take care of you. And you see this unfortunately in many places, even in the Muslim world, people hanging all sorts of amulets for protection. And so now you've been left to that protection. Instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protecting you, that blue hat or that weird eye thing or whatever, that thing is protecting you. 
And we all know that it doesn't protect. It doesn't protect. People that ask the question, they say, hold on a second, but I have a ta'weez. Is that allowed for me to have? Well, there are two types. There are two types. Many people, and I've seen this many times over my life, when they open up the ta'weez, they find that it is weird symbols and sorcery and magic. And they're shocked. And if you have one, feel free to open it. Just don't read it out loud. And you won't be able to read it out loud anyway because it's normally languages that are uh, not legible. Yeah. So that's number one. And then number two, so that's definitely not allowed. That's shit. It's not allowed. Then the second type of ta'wiz is one in which it is Quranic verses. And if it is Quranic verses, then it can't be shit because it's the Quran. And Abdullah, the son of Amr ibn As, he used to hand verses of the Quran, of the Quran on his children. So not only is it not haram, it's something that the Salaf used to do. The Sahaba. Or a, a small minority of the Sahaba, of course. But I would still tell you not to do it. You know what? Because if you make sure 100%, you're sitting there, you're watching the guy write your ta'weez. And you told him just ayat al kursi and that's it. And he writes it for you. And then you go and you hang it. You are then inspiring somebody else to go get a ta'weez made. And that person, are they going to be as diligent as you? A lot of times, no. They just go and they get a ta'weez made. Right, And so the idea of it being something that's sponsored, supported, promoted is not something that I would support at all. I, I would in fact warn people from hanging ta'wizes on their bodies. Make the athqaq. That's what the Qur'an was there for. Recite the verses. So don't just hang it. The Qur'an is meant to be recited. It's not meant to be hung anything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this. Uh, he says... But not only that, whoever is seeking assistance in other than Allah. And he says it's going to be failure. And failure is that a person looks left and right. They're looking left and right and they never look up. To ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told, I told Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says, إِذَا سَأَلْتُ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهُ وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهُ If you seek the help of anybody, seek the help of Allah. Seek the help of Allah. And Ibn al-Qayyim, he makes a beautiful statement and I'll end with this, he says, that if you find yourself raising your hands in dua, then in that moment you should be overjoyed. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not inspire you to ask, except because He wanted to give you. There are lots of people who are sick, they never raise their hands. There are lots of people who are poor, they never raise their hands. There are lots of people who are broken, they never raise their hands. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspires you to ask, then it's only because He wanted to give you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is best. With that, we end this section of the poem, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, if there are any questions, We'll take them, inshallah, otherwise we're done. Yes? I just had a quick question. Um, in the very beginning, we're talking about dunya. So I know that, you know, Islamically, it's perfectly fine to have money, spend your money. But I also feel like sometimes there can be excess as far as, like, some of the parties, there's like 55 desserts and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, and then everybody always says, well, it's objective because your money to someone else seems excessive. So is there any kind of guideline? For is there a guideline for what's in regard to what's called extravagance, israf? Is there a guideline? So let's say, for example, a $500,000 wedding. Is that extravagant? Yeah. Yes. Okay. What if, what if... <laughs> What if we just, uh, last year we watched the royal wedding, uh, Prince uh, Harry and, uh, was that last year? No. <laughs> we have two kids, huh? So whenever that royal wedding was, five years ago, let's say it was five years ago. Uh, COVID is an automatic like three years on. If you found out that that British wedding cost $500,000, would that sound extravagant to you? Um, it was still the British royal wedding was five hundred thousand dollars. No, right, and and the reason why is because exactly that it is relative to everybody. If if 
Uh, Warren Buffett, you found out Warren Buffett was driving a $20,000 car. Would you think, not $20,000, a $200,000 car. Would you think that extravagant for a guy who's worth however billion dollars he's worth? But you might have another guy who has uh, a $20,000 car and it's incredibly extravagant because he can't afford it. Right? It's way over budget for him. You might have one guy who's wearing a watch that's a $10,000 watch and for him, it's he's being stingy. And then you might have another person who's wearing a $10,000 watch and it is incredibly extravagant because that is way beyond their uh, ability, right? So extravagance absolutely is something that's relative depending on people's uh, ability and resources. Yes? Um, could it also be dependent like more on the community versus like your own means? Like, no. Like someone from Dubai versus someone from Mexico? Yeah, of course. Uh, can it be dependent on a person's own community as well? Absolutely. So uh, different cultures consider different things to be acceptable. And Islam is sensitive to cultural behavior. We have a, a, a principle that's called an Adam Hakkama. An Adam Hakkama means custom rules. So everything to the way that you dress, to the things that you do, to the way that you carry yourself, all of that is to... Islam says to take culture into consideration in all of these types of things. That's why you'll find people dressed in a particular way all over the Muslim world. And what is considered to be acceptable dress shifts from one culture to another. And what's considered to be acceptable behavior is very cultural specific. And that's fine. I was reminded of uh, when I went to Sweden for the first time, it was my first time seeing hijabis in mass or on mass riding bicycles. Never seen that before. And I remember asking the brothers there because many of them are coming from, especially when you're coming from like the Muslim world. I mean, do people ride bicycles throughout the streets of Islamabad and Cairo and stuff like that? Women? You guys look terrified to answer. The answer is no. <laughs> the answer is no, people don't do that, okay? You, your own grandmothers, if you sent them photos of you riding a bicycle, you might hear a lot, of, a lot from them. But the point here is that I remember sitting with the brothers there because in Sweden and in, in Scandinavia, like 80% or 70% of people ride bicycles there. It's just, it's like the most popular form of transportation. So I remember sitting with the brothers there and I was like, so is it weird for y'all that your sisters are riding bicycles? And they're like, why, why would it be weird? <laughs> they were like really curious. So like, why would it be? Meanwhile, in other places, it might actually be how long? Like, literally, you might have people say, this is how long? It's not allowed for women to ride bicycles this and sanctity and all this type of stuff. So culture has a very, very, very uh, big influence on what is considered to be appropriate and it can even influence what's considered to be how. Yes? And, uh, I took a couple of years ago, shout out to El Mugriff, because I remember taking a class in which we discussed this and was there not a Sahaba who in today's time would wear either a shirt or a thole, the equivalent of $4,000 or something like this, like their wealth was just that, but then they also spent that wealth as well. Yeah, there were many wealthy companions. And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Proclaim the blessings of your Lord. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa one time, he saw a man who was really disheveled. He looked really uh, homely. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to him, do you have wealth? And he said, yes. And he said, Allah loves when you have wealth for him to see the effects on your person. He loves for him to see the effects of wealth on you. So the idea of, of a person showing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given from a place of gratitude, there's nothing wrong with that. Yes, all the way in the back. Uh, don't we all have to there? There's more people around us. It doesn't matter how much wealth you have, especially in America, when it's a billionaire family, they have more money than the rest of the world. But that's the point, is that that person is not trying to be extravagant. Like, when you buy a $100 watch, right, or a $50 watch, you're not like, oh man, I'm really gonna stun on these poor people today. Like you're not thinking that. You're thinking this is a nice watch. I went and I bought it, I can afford it, that's it. But is there gonna be somebody who will look at your watch and be like, wow, I wish I could have that watch? Yes. But you're not, you're not, it's 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 so you cannot be held accountable for something that is so natural. You're not trying to be extravagant at all. That's the point, is that for different people. It's really different levels. If you're with people who are very, very wealthy, things that 
might seem extravagant to you, might be absolutely so normal to them that they don't even clock it. And that's just human nature. Yes? Um, on that with the gift giving, like growing somebody, like I love gift giving, so like giving a gift for somebody who's not in my tax bracket or can't afford to, you know, how do you go about extravagant gifts? It's like mostly this done. Is there anything about it? Are you talking about giving them gifts? Yeah. What's wrong with giving them a nice gift if you can afford it, even if they can't afford it? I've always been like told that that's not okay or whatever. So Umniyat is asking, is it okay for you to give somebody who's not in your tax bracket a gift that is nice? No, I, I don't. People like nice things. I don't see why I wouldn't give a person a nice gift if I could afford to give them a nice gift, even if they can't afford the equivalent gift. That's why it's a gift. So I'm not asking them to pay for it. 